There we go. Thank you. Yes, please give Salima Ra a round of applause. You'll get to meet her shortly. I am here to welcome you all and, of course, would like to first uh, bring to the microphone uh, Deborah Schwartz, who is the president of Brooklyn Historical Society. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Deborah Schwartz, uh, and I'm the president here, and I'm really happy to be welcoming you, you here this evening for an incredible program. Um, our program, Islam and the Soul of Hip Hop, uh, is going to be full of wonderful, engaging conversation and surprises, uh, and we're so pleased to have you all here. Can I just get a sense of how many are, of you are here for the first time? Just a show of hands. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome. Uh, to those of you who are regulars here, welcome as well. But uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, we hope this will be one of many, many trips to visit us. Uh, we, you'll hear a lot about a particular project that's happening here that's the impetus for this, which is our project called Muslims in Brooklyn. Uh, and when I introduce as uh, here Ali slightly more formally, um, he is the project director for that uh, incredibly important initiative that has been a really central part of our work over the last few years and will continue to be and will continue to do programs. So I hope that you will join us often. Please make sure that you uh, pick up our calendar so you know the programs that are happening. If you're so inclined and you want to join our email list, you'll get lots of information about uh, the programs that happen in this room, as well as our exhibitions, uh, as well as the, all of the interesting projects that are happening here, other exhibitions, an exhibition about the history of health and illness in Brooklyn that's right downstairs. Uh, an exhibition that's uh, closing very soon about the history of queer Brooklyn uh, and all of our interesting education programs and curriculum that are really important parts of our work. So uh, welcome and thanks for being here. What we're going to do this evening is I'm just going to introduce Zahir and he's going to take it from there and introduce the rest of the program. So uh, let me just tell you... Um, before I do that, um, a, a few other things. On tonight's program is uh, the wonderful Wes Jackson, who happens also to be uh, a, a trustee here at the Brooklyn Historical Society. And I just want to thank Wes for uh, all of his efforts on behalf of the institution, uh, as well as his efforts on behalf of hip hop in Brooklyn, um, which is really, truly an amazing effort uh, and commitment on his part. So. Thank you, Wes. Uh, so with that, uh, let me just tell you a little bit more about Zahir. Uh, he is our oral historian at Brooklyn Historical Society. We are very honored to have him in that role. Um, he also happens to be the co-host and co-producer of Flatbush and Main, which is our monthly podcast that explores Brooklyn's past and present. You should definitely check it out if you haven't. It's an incredibly rich and interesting uh, kind of journey through all kinds of historical information, tying them to contemporary issues as well, which is uh, something we specialize in here. History for us is not a thing of the past, but definitely uh, an eye to the future. His scholarly interests uh, include Malcolm X, Prince Rogers Nelson, Islam in America, and 20th century U.S. history. He teaches courses at NYU, uh, and he was the project manager and lead researcher for Manning Maribel's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Malcolm X, a Life of Reinvention. He has his undergraduate degree from Harvard, his MPhil from Columbia, uh, and he is uh, really at the center of so much of our work at Brooklyn Historical Society. Welcome, Zahir. So more formally, um, assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you, peace to the gods and earth, 
for people who do the math, today is the ninth day of the seventh month. Seven is the number of God, nine is the number of born. Uh, welcome to our cipher, where we are going to build on the topic Islam and the soul of hip hop. And as Deborah mentioned, this is part of a larger initiative here at Brooklyn Historical Society called the Muslims in Brooklyn Project, which has uh, as its objective to promote three main ideas. One, that Muslims have a long history in Brooklyn, in New York City, and in the United States. Two, that there is no one profile by which you can identify Muslims. We, co we cover many ethnicities, nationalities, traditions, and three, that Muslims have been integral to Brooklyn. They have been, uh, have been shaped by Brooklyn and have also shaped Brooklyn, which brings me to today's topic, which is looking at the ways that Muslims have shaped and actually have been integral um, since the origins of hip hop. And we are so fortunate to have the panel that we do have with us. Um, and before I introduce them, I do have to do some housekeeping and talk a little bit more about what this project has been. So part of this project at its core has been an oral history project where we spent the last year collecting oral histories um, of Muslims in Brooklyn. And two of our uh, presenters today are in that collection. And we are now using those oral histories to do public programming such as this one. We are developing a K through 12 school curriculum that we will launch in November of this year. We are working with a very talented Muslim uh, Brooklyn artist named Camila Janan Rashid, who is developing an arts installation based on the oral histories, and that arts installation will open to the public on September 7th, and will be open until June 30th, 2020. So you have a lot of time to come check it out. It is a sound and art installation that offers the visitor a 3D surround sound experience with the oral histories and the visual art that Camila is creating. And we have a series of programs, one program, at least one program every month for the rest of this year. On August 15th, we are having a program uh, where we are going to screen the documentary Watched, which is a documentary on the NYPD's um, surveillance and infiltration of Brooklyn College students. Uh, we will screen that documentary and have a panel discussion with Jean Theo Harris, who is a professor at Brooklyn College, Aviva Stahl, who was a journalist who helped break this story, and Rabia Asin, who was a student at Brooklyn College during the time that a paid informant was infiltrating the student organizations there. Then on September 26th, here also at Brooklyn Historical Society, we are going to have a joint program with BRIC on Muslim visual artists, because from September 13th to November 10th, BRIC is opening their fall show called Beyond Geographies, featuring the works of Muslim artists. And uh, in October, we are still finalizing the date, but we are going to have a night focusing on um, the literary arts with writers from Brooklyn. And in November, on November 15th, which is a Friday, we're going to have a night of song and storytelling with Al Sara and the Nubatones, who is a very talented uh, Sudanese uh, musician and group that we hope you come out to. And then finally in December, we will be closing out um, this, at least this year of programming with a dance party um, on December 12th. So stay tuned for all of these programs. Of course, you will be immediately plugged into all of these programs if you uh, become a member, which we encourage you to do. All right, I have to do one more thing, and that is to thank our sponsors for our programs and this project, and um, I will just read it, read it out so I don't miss anyone. The Muslims in Brooklyn project is made possible through the generous support of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts Building Bridges Program, the Ford Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the Nissan Foundation, the Pillars Fund, Pop Culture Collaborative, and New York City Council members Robert Cornegay, uh, Raphael Espinal, and Brad Lander. All right, so to begin our program, I want to introduce you in person to Salima Ra, who is going to um, give us a little acapella performance 
um, to help set the tone for tonight's discussion. Peace and blessings, how are you? Good. I promise I didn't have shades on to be cool. I went to the beach and I feel like I look crazy a little bit. So, <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna sit those right there. Um, it's beautiful to be here. I feel your energy, it's nice. I s decided to just do a little acapella piece because um, I knew how intimate these things are, um, or programs are. So I said, why not do something that I have um, about inspiration? Because that's what we ultimately, as artists and as believers of whatever religion you are, we get inspiration from all kinds of things, from our, our books, nature, from um, communication, you know. Um, I actually have little rocks here. I get inspiration from nature. It's my thing. <laughs> All right, so let me, uh, let me do this. So I'm gonna say, Look at all your inspiration, where it's coming, coming from. Look at all your inspiration, where it's coming, coming from. I really want you to think about that, though. Sometimes we forget what inspires you to get back on track or to inspires you to create, because I know most of you are artists. So that's it. Let me go into the verse. Look for the inspiration. Look for the alternate of what you're facing. Look towards the sun, moon, and the sky. See the reason why the most high provide. That's life in a nutshell, the reason we prevail. Alchemists, understand the language of this realm. Galaxy, set standards for the stars. Venus hit the ball, raise the ball for the Mars. The sons of Kemet, Fulani, native Aborigine. Mongo crossed the Barrow Strait so I can intercede. Mixed with African traits, American indeed. We was here before the modern day, uh, know what I mean? Coltrane, love supreme. So I'm on my dean, got a fill a donut like Dilla, cause I'm baking the bee. Gotta put a limit to kill her so that they can receive. Gotta put a life in the meaning so that look at all your inspiration. You can clap. Ration. Where it's coming, coming from. Look at all your inspiration. Where it's coming, coming from. Think about it. Look at all your inspiration. Where it's coming, coming from. Look at all your inspiration. Where it's coming, coming from. Now you can't perform without doing some a little participation audience. So I want y'all to say where it's coming from, because I want this to be in your head before you leave it. So I'm gonna say, look at all your inspiration. You're gonna say where it's coming, coming from. Look at all your inspiration. One more time. Look at all your inspiration. Where it's coming, coming from. Yeah, thank you. That's all I got. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce the rest of our panelists, and uh, I'm going to start by introducing Salima formally, since she is already up. And. <laughs> As I call the other panelists in the order, please, um, oh, I guess I don't need this, right? Oh, you could, t is it, it, they work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you've heard from Salima Ra. Um, she honed her skills as an artist in New York City's jazz community and has performed at numerous venues including the New Yorican Cafe, Brooklyn Academy of Music, Bricks Celebrate Brooklyn Festival, Lincoln Center, Levitt Pavilion, Los Angeles, Carnegie Hall with Soul Science Band, and Jazzy Jazz Festival at Medgar Evers uh, with Rudy Mwangozi. Mm -hmm. Salima Ra, please welcome her again. <laughs> Next, um, I'd like to bring to the stage Wes Jackson. Wes has over 20 years of experience as an entrepreneur. 
and innovator in the music business, his career began as a concert producer and promoter for legendary headliners across hip hop and other genres. In 2005, West founded the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival with the mission to create a world-class event to honor hip hop music and culture in the borough of Brooklyn. Since then, the festival has hosted a range of amazing talent. He currently serves as executive in residence and director of the Business of Creative Enterprises program in the Department of Marketing Communication at Emerson College. And I want to um, also just give additional props for Wes. This, this event was actually planned to coincide with the annual Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival, and they decided to take a year off. Um, so we are very happy to be the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival <laughs> event. <laughs> And um, we're grateful um, for Wes's partnership in helping us to think through and formulate uh, tonight's uh, program. Uh, next, I'd like to bring to the stage Fahim Abdul Wasi. Um, <laughs> Fahim is a longtime writer, author, lecturer, and higher education professional. With 12 years of professional journalism experience under his belt, he gained recognition through his time at The Source magazine, where he worked his way up the ladder from being a contributing writer in 2000 to editor-in-chief editor in 2005. And for those of you who are hip-hop heads, you know that, that at that time, especially, The Source magazine was considered the go-to magazine on hip-hop. His work has also appeared in Vibe and Variety, and since 2012, he has been working in the field of higher education and is currently writing his debut book on black manhood in the 21st century titled One Step Beyond. Fahim is also a featured narrator in our Muslims in Brooklyn oral history collection, so if you want to learn more about his life story, you can check out our oral history collection. And then finally, and not least at all, is Swad Abdul Kabir. Swad, please come. And uh, Suad is a scholar, artist, activist who uses anthropology and performance to explore the intersections of race and popular culture. She's currently associate professor of American culture and Arab and Muslim American studies at the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor. Her latest work, which is on sale at our bookstore, mm -hmm is Muslim Cool, Race, Religion, and Hip Hop in the United States. It's an ethnography of Islam and hip hop that examines how intersecting ideas of Muslimness and blackness challenge and reproduce the meanings of race in the United States. So we welcome you to uh, certainly um, pay attention to our panel, but feel free to use social media. We have on the screen everyone's Twitter and or Instagram uh, accounts. Um, and uh, the hashtag that we would like for you to use um, is Islam and Hip Hop BHS. So um, please join in in the conversation and then at the uh, second portion of this program, we will welcome the Q&A portion. Um, I wanted to start uh, this conversation um, going to each person and giving them a chance to tell us about their first encounter with hip hop and Islam, just to kind of give us a sense of that history. And um, I think uh, we're gonna start with Fahim. And so each of them submitted something that they thought could help us tell that story. So Fahim sent us wow. this picture <laughs> from um, back in the day, Fahim. <laughs> I still look the <laughs> same though. <laughs> um, and uh, if you could tell us a little bit in, in short, right? Because okay. we, we're gonna, I'm gonna keep the time on y'all. All right. Um, and, I, and I see you wearing this pin. So tell us what that pin was and maybe how that was your point of, one of your points of entry into hip hop and Islam. All right, bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Wow. Peace, peace, peace to the gods and the earth. Um, I wanted to, that was 1991. And I was like, uh, for those who don't remember, uh, but for those who do, there was an Islamic community known as the Ansarullah community in Bushwick, Nubian Islamic Hebrews. So that was, uh, and I was a part of that, um, you know, study. I never joined the community, but I was really highly uh, influenced by them. I would go to their classes that they held every Sunday at the Hall of Knowledge. 
And, um, you know, just being a, a, a young person, a teenager in high school, um, that, that ideology was very, very attractive to me. And there was also, you know, like the crew that I was rolling with, you know, a lot of us was either 5% Nation of Islam or Ansars. So, you know, we had a lot of, how can I say, kinship, you know, because of the ideology, you know. So, um, and that's when, this was in Central Park, actually. And this is like a part of a picture of my, my rap crew at the time. So it was like three Ansars and one God body, 5% of it. So we took a photo, you know, for like our, um, like our press kit. So that's what that was about. So that was, uh, and, and it's like black, red, and green, you know, the, the black nationalist colors, but flipped over, you know, which is red, black, and green, but they flipped it over. And, you know, the um, uh, Tasmiya, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, with the uh, spear and the, uh, the crescent around the spear, which paid homage to uh, Muhammad al Mahdi, Muhammad Ahmed al Mahdi, which they, they called the Mahdi um, from Sudan. So that was that. Was that. Okay. Um, I think next we have Suad, and I am going to introduce uh, Suad. Uh, she sent me, Suad is like a renaissance, all of these folk, like Fahim, it was like not just a journalist, but a, clearly you were a rapper too yes. at some point. Um, I drew graffiti, but it's not about me. <laughs> 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 I joke. <so. laughs> I think we have all elements here. Maybe so, and Swat is a dancer too, so I think we have all the elements of hip hop represented. Um, so I'm going to play this short um, clip um, called Suaz Rap. I'm a poet, not an MC, so bear with me as I put you on to who I be. I was raised in the borough of Brooklyn, raised learning Arabic and the thick of lipstick into this music. My head would bop to this music part of hip hop but I can't stop there till I'll make one thing clear like Aisha radiallahu anha I am the daughter of converts to Islam and I thank my umi for raising me right yes I thank my umi for keeping things tight and tonight is dedicated to those who made it despite being hated and degraded their job to survive so I could be here alive and free the S the U the A to the D so I that's who I be <laughs> So like the rap says, I'm a poet, not an MC. But so, it was, so um, oh, yeah, that was good. But what that was from, I, I, I thought it would be funny to play. So my very first presentation on Islam and Hip Hop happened in 2002 in Damascus, Syria. I ended up giving the presentation as a part of Black History Month programming that was being offered at the American Cultural Center in Damascus. Um, I offered it as an alternative to what they were planning. They were planning to play Boys in the Hood, He Got Game, and um, Love and Basketball. <laughs> and so, and I was appalled. And I actually told them, I was like, you should invite Professor Suleiman Yang, who's, who was a sort of a scholar and a foundational scholar on Islam in America. But they were like, no, you're here, because you're 24, I don't know. Anyway, so, um, so I ended up doing, the, doing that. But I opened it up. I was like, I'm going to write this rhyme. So that's what that is. So it was, this is like from 2002. So it's like, well, a while ago now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's archival now, yeah. <laughs> that's right, right. So that's, that's what that's from. OK. Um, next, we have Wes. So Wes sent me this image uh, to talk about his first encounter. Wes, tell us, tell us about what this means to you. Uh, so as the, um, uh, I probably grew up listen, reading a lot of your writings, so I'm a bit of the, the nerd and sort of the person behind the scenes. But uh, at the time when Brand Nubian came out, I guess this is like 1990, 1990. Awful One comes out. So I'm going to uh, boarding school, grew up in the South Bronx, but going to boarding school. I'm going through this sort of level of culture shock where at home it's all black and Puerto Rican. You go away and you're the one brown spot in the, in the sea of white. So I, I, I was one of the reasons why hip hop is so important to me is because it helped kind of correct that, all right? Or keep me from going over the edge, to be honest. But then connecting me to my community when there were a lot of people who were trying to disconnect me from, the, from my own community. So when this album came out, I was like, so who are these dudes? And look at how they're dressing and look at what they're talking. And they're talking, uh, you know, supreme mathematics. And, I, and what I sent to Zaheer was, I went, I, I think it was my brother. I'm going to blow him up, although I'm not quite sure. And I tried to get him to explain to me what uh, Grand Poobah was going, I think it was in the uh, 
Wake Up uh, in the remix when he runs through the Supreme Mathematics. So I was like, what goes, what is he talking about? And he tried to front like he knew what, <laughs> what, it, what it meant. Um, but at that time, it was a weird thing because there was, there was you know, a lot of, uh, I guess, educated or somewhat middle class black kids kind of hitting hip hop and seeing the level of empowerment with a group like this. And then there was a lot of dudes coming home from upstate um, who had got knowledge of self. And those two worlds were, were combining. So you had the little nerd like me in a suit and tie, and then you had the dude who just got off the bus you know, from, from, from upstate or maybe from Rikers. And we're looking at each other like, so this is the group that we both understand. Uh, and I think I put this in here. That was my first introduction uh, to, you know, to uh, Islam in hip hop, and it, and it very much shaped uh, my worldview, and I think many others of my generation. Thanks. Okay, Salima so um, wanted to talk about fashion mm -hmm. and the importance of what fashion signified uh, in her encounter. Growing up, this is how everybody looked in my community. So that's yeah. wild to see as a child, you see that on television as well. And obviously it's not completely, it's only one, you'll see it um, in the midst of uh, a bunch of things that are not this, <laughs> obviously, you know, the, the, the default, right? Um, so that's, that's my introduction to hip hop as far as like hear, listen, hearing my brother listen to Rakim and him saying assalamu alaikum and you know, peace be upon you. And you know, as a child, that's like, oh, no, that, he know us. <laughs> you know what I mean? You feel apart. So I feel like um, culturally, that's what connected me. It made me feel as though um, this, is, this is not just something you see on television or hear on the radio. This is in my home. This is in my mosque. This is um, an alternate, al alternative to uh, the norm, you know? And that's what, it's, it's not conforming. So I saw us as something, a little, a little bit different, obviously. When you go to school, you feel different. Or, or wherever you go and um, publicly. So to see them look like me and say, speak like me and um, present themselves in, in the same nature that, that my family and my community does, is, it was obviously, okay, that's mine. <laughs> I'm a part, so that's that. I think that thinking about the role of community is important. Mm -hmm. I want us to think about what, one of the things that always interests me is what about Islam and hip hop work so well together, right? Because in the conversation with Suad, you know, um, we, were, we were talking about, I don't even think of talking about the influence of Islam on hip hop, in, on hip hop suggests that Islam and hip hop were ever apart. And she said to me, Islam has always been a hip hop, right? And so trying to think about what about Islam and hip hop works so well together. Um, I want us to, to kind of meditate on that. And Fahim, since your, your encounter talked about the role of community, what is it about what was going on in the community that lent itself to these expressions in, in hip hop? Who were the people in the community and what role did they play in bridging these two worlds? That's actually a question, something that me and my brother's been building about for years. I mean, the thing about the community presence, like blackness and Islam was not inseparable. It was, like, it was, it was together. So like as a young person who wasn't Muslim, just seeing how um, people who are of uh, different faiths, but they were tied together politically. So you had a lot of meeting places. One of the main meeting places uh, for a lot of black people was the slave theater. So, and I got introduced to that to my, through my uncle, who's Muslim, who introduced me to Islam. But he was like, you know, we're black people, but we're also Muslim. So he didn't separate himself from these community gatherings. You get what I'm saying? So that had an imprint on me. In addition to what was going on in, the New, York, in New York City at the time, in the 80s, you know, there was a lot of racial strife. Um, and... These are the things I was also impacting the music as it was, you know, germinating throughout New York City. So, um, so you know, you, you're walking down the street, you, you're passing by Master the Taco, or you're passing by um, 
you know, other, you know, masjids, other mosques in, in this, in, in, around Brooklyn and in, in this city. And they're also passing by vendors who, hap, you know, happen to be Muslims, but of different, you know, groups and saws. And you go further uptown, you see a bunch of guards, 5% is built on the corner. So then you see a brothers, brothers with the final call in, in suit and bow ties. So it's like all of this was happening at the same time. In addition, these people were also engaging with um, other black nationalist folks. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't separate. So as a young person who wasn't born into the faith, um, you were very, it's very, you were very, I was very impressionable. I was very impressed by what, what I was seeing going on in Brooklyn and, and New York City as a whole because it wasn't separate. You know, so you got people, not just the slave theater, but also in Queens. Uh, you had the African Poetry Theater. Uptown, you had the First World. You know, so I was a young person. I was going to meetings like the Republic of New Africa. You know, so one of the leaders of that was Ahmed Obafemi, who's Shaka Zulu's father. Shaka Zulu is the co-founder of DTP Records, um, which is ludicrous. You know, so these people come out of these lines. You get what I'm saying? So there was no separation. So that community presence, you know, it, it really impacted me and impacted a lot of people of that time. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, uh, Bernard Getz, it was Howard Beach, it was Yusuf Hawkins. All of these things were going on at the time in New York City that, you know, as a young person, either pushed you to like, want to, you know, get a gauge of what's going on and find some answers. And sometimes for, some, for a lot of young black men, it was that Muslim brother on the street who gave you the answers because it was there. It was very visible and it was very present. So I, thinking about that, um, I want to come at this from the side of the spiritual framework. Um, you know, how is it that, what was it about hip hop that bonded to the spiritual tradition of, of Islam from the perspective of within the Muslim community? All right. Okay, so speaking of spirituality, actually I forgot to sort of open the name of Allah for the love of Muhammad to honor the ancestors and the celebration of my people. Amen. And as a descendant of stolen people on stolen land, I also want to begin an acknowledgement that the land on which we gather, the place we call home, Brooklyn, is the ancestral unceded territory of the indigenous people of this region. Um, spirituality, so when I think about um, hip hop and spirituality and this sort of connection, one of the things that I sort of talk about in my own work um, and when hip hop communities, they talk about hip hop in terms of elements, right? So you have sort of the artistic elements, emceeing, DJing, dance, graffiti. And then there's the fifth element, which is knowledge, or knowledge of self. And knowledge of self is something that comes directly from black Muslim communities, specifically from the Nation of Islam. Um, so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in his book, Message to the Black Man, sort of gives this kind of exegesis, this sort of explanation of what knowledge of self is. And I like to think of knowledge of self as kind of like knowing where you come from so you can understand where you are, so you can do something to act upon your future. And this, I think, is something that really resonated with the communities, the sort of the black, um, the Afro-diasporic, Latinx communities that created hip hop. So one of the people I interview also um, is pop master Fable, um, who is, original member of the um, Rocksteady crew, right? Which is like the first B-Boy crew. And he talks about listening to the radio. And what was the station? W-H-B-I. Um, yeah, W-H-B-I. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about listening to the radio and hearing like sort of Malcolm X over breakbeats, Minister Farrakhan over breakbeats. Um, and he called them, in these songs, he called them warning songs, right? These songs that kind of were um, warning, talking about social issues, right? And giving people ways to interpret them understand what's happening and then encouraging you to do something about them. And those being very central to sort of how hip hop emerges and grows. And so I think, and I think for me, when I think about hip hop, so, so this idea of knowledge of self, which also I should just say for the Muslims in the room, incidentally, I also, I, the earlier, uh, the earlier iteration of this I found in the 12th century, um, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali's book, The Alchemy of Happiness, and the first chapter is called Knowledge of Self. Um, so this idea of having knowledge of self and cultivating it, understanding it, is sort of really central to hip hop and is also central to Islam. Yes. And, and, it's, and it's central to hip hop because it was central to Islam, because it was central to the black people who were sort of bringing Islam to hip hop community. So in, in a way, and again, it's like, it's, it's hard to kind of like take them apart mm -hmm. because they kind of come together at the same time. But that's, but I think sort of, you know, sort of knowledge of self and having that, cultivating that, understanding that is really, I think, the thing that brings them together. 
Wes, that brings me to you. Um, tell us a little bit about politically what brought these two together in, in your, your experience. Well, <clears throat> well, well, first before I do that, because uh, everyone's been gracious, and yourself included, to say something about me, we need to just give it up for Zaheer for one quick second before we go too far, <laughs> uh, for putting this whole thing together. <laughs> Not only this event, but this entire program. And I remember when we, I think there was the board meeting when this was announced, and I wasn't there, and I was on the conference call, and Zaheer's like, yeah, I want to talk to, you know, Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, and I'm like, so this is the meeting I miss when we, we start talking about Rakim and all this, but this has been a long time coming, so I just want to give it up to the brother before we all get um, uh, too deep, because this is amazing, and, it, and how it connects to, uh, to politically, what I've always said is that uh, hip hop is, uh, was always looking for an infrastructure, a philosophy to attach itself to. Uh, and, to, and to echo what everybody else is saying is, in the communities, we saw that infrastructure. You saw the uniforms, you saw the literature, you saw the stands, and I think there was a natural gravitation to, well, well these brothers and sisters seem to have it together, uh, so I'm just gonna kinda link in with them. And then even to what sisters was talking about, the words as not being of the faith, it took me many, many years when I was managing an artist who's, who's a member of the Nation of Gods and Earth, J-Live, and we would casually use these words, you know, like, do the knowledge, like, you know, peace, God, say all these things. And he checked us one day, was like, yo, you can't, like, if you're going to say that, no, but you have to understand when you're talking about my culture, my philosophy, and had wonderful conversations on bus rides where he broke it down to me as much as I, he could without me being a student. Um, but I realized that, that politically it was we needed words to articulate what we were trying to accomplish. Um, and again, the infrastructure was there. And if you go back to the origins of hip hop, uh, going back to Zulu Nation, the Hip Hop Master Fable, Rocksteady Crew, they were always, you know, the, the, the uh, various the Ansars, the, the gods and earths were always there. So I think it is, uh, it was just a natural sort of upbringing. And, when we were thinking about doing this panel, what I said to Zaheer is without being the, there was times when I was the old man on, my, on the lawn saying, you kids, you know, hip hop is better, you know, back in my days. I don't say that anymore because it's not true. We had tons of whack rappers with our generation, <laughs> which nobody, no, no, no. You, you wrote about them many. No, no. But what I did say to Zaheer, what I think is lacking is there is no world view, right? right? There's no way to think above, uh, uh, beyond yourself of how you see a woman on the street, there's language of how you address her, right? There's language of how you treat the elders. Now it's we've gone head forth into capitalism and hyper-consumerism, and that is the philosophy, and that's just not, it's too thin compared um, you know, to what we're talking about here. So I think in those formative stages, we needed something really meaty to latch on to, and to, uh, you know, no pun intended, but build off of. And I think that's why you see so much of it. Um, and you still see it now. I mean, the, the, you, the influence is still there, right? We I was talking about, you know, my brother Franzi, you talk about Nipsey Hussle, you see giving back to the community. These are tenants that go mm -hmm. all the way back, you know, to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It just it may not be a, a, a straight line, but it's, yeah. it's still there. We, we definitely want to think about what is happening now, so I want to come back to that. Um, Salima, as the, I guess the, we can say the practicing artist uh, on this, this panel, <laughs> I'm interested in hearing from your perspective in terms of the, the cultural practices of hip hop and in the Muslim communities of your experience. How did they meld? What is it that as a Muslim hip hop artist, um, how do you navigate that experience? As me personally, right? Yeah, or just, you know, what is it that you think work artistically? What is it, are there things about Islam that lend themselves to the mm -hmm. artistic practice of hip hop? Are there things about hip hop that lend themselves to the cultural expressions that are in Islam? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, just being, let's see, as far, personally, I think the, the, the content, well, the former content, like you were saying, like now there's no, you know, connection as far as to to any morality, very, or it's very very short, very small. Um, but but originally you had 
um, the dis discussions of um, spirituality, and it's very, right now we're not kind of uh, receiving that too much on a, on, a, on a public level. I think, as for me, I try to write from my experience as a believer, as a person that's overcoming uh, difficulties, as we all are, and you receive uh, inspiration. And that's why I did that tune today. Um, God gives you inspiration in different ways. He gives you from, from um, scripture, from nature, from your communication with people. And I feel as, as, as a Muslim and as an artist, it goes hand in hand for me to give what I receive as far as from, from God, from the creator. We have a responsibility, I feel, to do that. We don't have to be extra pre preachy, <laughs> but if you, get, if you have something good, if you receive um, good information, why not give it? You know, I always say that if you have children and you know prayer, why, why not give your children prayer? A lot of people forget that, and the kids be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like, but don't you do that every day so you can, you know, you can uplift and enlighten yourself and go to the next level, that next realm of, 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 of spirituality. Music is that altogether, it's inspiration. Um, so that, it just goes hand in hand in that way. Okay. That's all, yes. I, I just wanted to add to what she was saying when you were mm -hmm. saying about the music and inspiration, and so like also like other artists I've talked to too, and talking about what lends you like what lends itself. Well, mm -hmm. One of the things about um, the Islam and the Quran is poetry, mm -hmm. right? right? And right. so the idea is that the Quran is not poetry, right? But mm -hmm. this is highest, this high highest form of mm -hmm. communication, mm -hmm. and so and we think about. Sort of a lot of like, I know MCs I will talk to, Muslims will be like, well, yeah, well, you know, there's this tradition, right, of this eloquence, right, right that comes from Muslims, and both in terms of the Quran itself, but mm -hmm. also the, the early Muslim community, which was from sort of, you know, was present day Saudi Arabia, had a rich poetry tradition as well. Mm -hmm. And then in West Africa, you have a rich poetry tradition, right? So you find kind of like the word and the power of the word and the power of the eloquence kind of being continually mm -hmm. kind of playing itself out in Muslim communities. And now you, you have hip hop, mm -hmm. right? Sort of bringing that up and sort of taking it further. Yeah, I think also of the, the boast. Mm -hmm. um, so like Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest, right? Which is, um, kind of sets the stage mm -hmm. for people attaching themselves to an attribute of God, because mm -hmm. in Islam, the greatest, or Akbar, right. Is, right. is God, right? It's one of his 99 attributes. And this lends itself in hip hop to the MC saying, mm -hmm. like, I'm the I best. Am. Yeah. Yes, I and am. Yeah. Uh, that boast uh, that's rooted in a divine characteristic. And a lot right? of our parents that um, took on the religion, they they came from not knowing who they were, not understanding um, the images that were given to them as, um, what, you know, that, well, that's in my case, in my, yeah, my parents' absolutely. case, it's like, what, it, that's God? Yeah. <laughs> like, I that's mean, not it, me, yeah. that don't look like me. How do I understand? At 15 years old, my mother, you know, she came to, to un try to understand herself better, and that was through the Creator and saying, like, um, building a confidence. So in hip hop, right. it's like, I'm, Right. That's you know? right. I mean, it was so fascinating. There's this, you know. there's a, there's a, a verse in the Quran, and you know, we understand it who believe that the Quran is God's word, mm -hmm. where God essentially is challenging people who they think that it's okay. a forgery, right? They think it's, it's not divine, and in the Quran it says, "Go, if you think this is fake, if you think this is man-made, I dare you, I challenge you." And I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. I challenge you to, I challenge you to produce a better verse. Right, like, which is show and prove. It's like MC being like, you, I challenge you to come with something better. And I remember having kind of come through hip hop when I, by the time I got to that verse, I was like, wait a minute, God's trying to be like, I'm the MC. Um, so and, you know, yeah, there, this, yeah. To, to add on to that, this is why, you know, I, I, I talked to an elder, he said, you know, um, history is gonna vindicate the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Hmm. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I heard, uh, I heard uh, the psychologist Dr. Amos Wilson say um, he's so misunderstood and he, is, he can be considered one of the greatest black psychologists that we ever had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To reverse the mindset of a people, yeah. to give them worth and value. 
I mean, you know, we could have theological disagreements and everything like that. That's another discussion. But nobody can tell me about, my, you know, why I still love that man. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And his impact, not just on, you know, black people, but also hip hop. I mean, the presence of the Food of Islam at a lot of con early concerts, hip hop probably wouldn't have grown the, the way it had if it wasn't for the fruit. Because I was at some of those concerts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of brothers have private security contracts. And it was the fruit that was securing a lot of um, events. So much respect to the fruit of Islam. That makes me think, Wes, of um, 2014, yeah. um, when the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival had Jay Electronica and Jay-Z. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened, what, how it appeared, like what, what was that, the impact of that? And for people who don't know, describe what the scene was. Yeah, so this, so again, as he was in 14, was our 10th anniversary, so we had a big, um, put a lot of effort into try to celebrate what we had accomplished in Jay Electronica and Ray Kwan, who was, a, who was Nation of Gods of Earth, was, was our two headliners. And Jay Electronica had cooked up, uh, as soon as we had booked them, had began to coordinate with Jay-Z, uh, about making a, a guest appearance. So last 10 days or so, uh, these things kick into gear. Um, it is, I mean, some people may in here know when, you, when somebody like a Jay-Z comes around, I, I, it is, and I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, you know, give him a platitudes, but it's very much like the president coming into town in terms of like security plans and, you know, and public safety, you have to work with the NYPD. So it's a big thing. But to Fahim's point, one of the things that got added to the security plan was the fruit of Islam that J that J Electronica felt more comfortable. We have Universal Zulu Nation. Zulu Security yes. does, has been mm -hmm. doing our security for the past six, seven years, which mm -hmm. is a, again a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But J Electronica um, made a point that he wanted the fruit to come in here to secure J specifically, not his person. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, this is all. So that morning, the brothers going to sort of file in and. They are quite, uh, you know, <laughs> intimidated. You know, there is a sense of like purpose of Absolutely. this better be done. You know, I need this, I need here. And we've been doing security plans for, for months. You know, I apologize that's my, my son who's making all that noise. My wife took him out. But she handles all the production about it. But um, just, just how we had to rearrange things uh, according to uh, the, 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 lev uh, the levels of professionalism, I have to say, that the fruit did, but so when, Jay, when, when Jay-Z arrives on, on scene, they were dispatched, and they surrounded him very much like a phalanx. If you see pictures, it's quite impressive of uh, sort of Jay-Z kind of by himself. He has this one, if anybody knows, he has this one sort of, yeah. that, that Russian yeah. guy yeah. that's always yeah. with him, yeah. who you really don't, yeah. he's the one who has, must yeah. have like 17 <laughs> guns stashed <laughs> everywhere. But it was him, and he walked in, and he was at peace because he was completely surrounded by the fruit. And um, at also at our, at that event, Jay had uh, the seven and the crescent pendant that he then uh, gave uh, Jay Electronica, which was a sort of a, uh, sort of the crystallized some of the stuff that that we talk about um, things that just didn't happen. He used to give people the Rockefeller chain, which was you know, platinum and diamonds, and it was this other, other sort of hip hop, and Jay has sort of transitioned, and now he said, now welcome to the family, here is, you know, uh, my, my proof that I've had my 120 lessons, and et cetera. But anyway, it was, it, was, it was quite a thing to see, and again, for being up here, I'm I, I probably the most disconnected on a day-to-day on a, on a -day basis, but uh, observing it from, from a distance, it was, I mean, it was, it was awe-inspiring to have them roll up in there, and we made every accommodation to them out of that respect mm -hmm. from, you know, growing up. These were the dudes that you didn't mess with. These were the ones who got you in trouble if you were, um, you know, out of pocket. And, um, you know, they were the elders that I think we've, we've lost a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, um, that makes me think about the, the importance of manhood and womanhood in how some of this shows up throughout the history of hip hop. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, 
I, I don't want to like ask the men about the men and ask the women about the women. Like I don't want to do that. So I'm just gonna put it out and, and let y'all who wants to jump in. Um, because when I was trying to compile, um, you know, like a playlist of the the, the like early influence of Islam and hip hop. Um, it was it was all mostly men, right? Yes. And that, mm -hmm. that that is not just about Islam. That's about what was going on in hip hop. Yes. Um, that women weren't getting the same kinds of opportunities. But um, I'm interested in hearing the the panel's response and and it, to not be like pointing specific people. I'm going to sweep down. I'll start with Suad oh, and wow. then. Uh, well, we'll start with Salima and sweep down this way. And I think Salima, Salima especially because you, as an artist who is a woman um, and performing, I wonder what your experience has been like, both in the artistic community, but also in the Muslim community, um, who may have, um, you know, p opinions about what women should do or what even what artists should do. So if you can talk a little bit about how your sense as a um, black Muslim woman artist has been shaped in this. Well, you know, I, a while ago, maybe about, um, I, don't, I don't maybe about 10 years, I was, 10 years ago, I was working at um, CBS and BET, and we were trying, I, I, in the midst of that, we were trying to get like music to like Stephen Hill, Stephen Hill, right? And a lot of them were interested in what, in what we were doing. And me in particular, um, it's funny because I was kind of nervous. I was like, I'm not changing nothing <laughs> about what I'm wearing. I'm keeping, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know what, what they want to do to me, do with me. So I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to go into that whole situation because I already know what it is, right? Um, but it was interesting because Stephen Hill actually was like, oh, this is a relief. Like, I'm tired of seeing, like, Nicki Minaj kind of, you know, that stuff. So I was like, oh, but then there was other people, like, we got to, I'm talking about as far as clothing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want you to kind of be a little, little sexy and whatever. But I feel like today, right now, you can, you can be, it's like, it's like in the beginning, like it's made a full circle. And I think that's because of social media and it's a different time. Everybody's not getting signed. You don't need that, really. You just kind of like make your own way. Um, so at, at the moment, I don't feel any kind of way. I feel like I can be myself and um, like there's no distinction like hip, hip hop and Islam. Like, and by the way, I'm a, like originally I'm a jazz vocalist, and I, but I'm a writer. So I started, I came into, um, and as we know, Ella Fitzgerald is the first female MC, right? <laughs> yeah, if you can scat, you can rap. If you can rap, you can scat. So um, as a jazz vocalist, I, you know, hip hop is like, rapping is not too far, you know, poetry. If you're, you're a poet and you sing, you can rap. That's what I, I was like, I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna do this. Um, but not to get too far off what we're talking about. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's like, I feel, I feel comfortable today because you can be your own artist and, and, and uh, have your creativity the way you need it. I was something else on my mind, but I'm going to let y'all go so I can remember it because yeah. that's what happens when you write. Yeah. <laughs> Wes? Um, now you got me, so I forgot to put it. The, the, the question about how gender is constructed in, in yes. this. I mean, I do think in terms of the broader gender, I, I agree with what you're saying in this democratization that technology has brought. Right. You don't have to fit that, that mold right. that, uh, you know, Stephen, Stephen Hill or Lior Cohen decided, you know, some, some odd years ago, which right. is great. And I think there's a lot of um, uh, our community, again, who's sick of it. There's women who are tired of it, been tired of it, right. and now have a chance to break it. There's men who are who respect, uh, respect that decision and are tired of it as well. Um, so I think that is a good thing. I do do sort of, at, from a historical perspective, I was listening to, this is not necessarily like um, on, on, on point, but there was like a, uh, there's an LL Cool J song, like a big old butt, right? Like, oh, Brenda got a big old butt, right? So anyway, it's a, it's, right, there's, a, there's a line where he says, you know, she's, I was cruising the high school 
you know, looking for cuties to get on my jock. And she's like 17, but don't sleep. And then he proceeds to talk about how he had sex with this woman who was under 17. And it made me think about the, the brand Nubian. There are some things that Lord Jamar will say that, you know, if this woman does it, submit to me, you know, um, you know, then, you know, I'm going to kick her out. Not to sort of implies violence, but there is, as much as I do, I think, celebrate the philosophy and the worldview, there were some, me not being of the faith, uh, sort of difficult things in that whole era mm -hmm. that were articulated um, that I think maybe we're reconciling now that women are having the voice again. Yeah. Uh, you maybe you, I, I doubt you're going to hear a lyric like that coming out of out of out of your mouth. But I think um, there there was it's some of it was prob was was problematic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, in, the, in in those times looking back. Some of this stuff kind of went over my head as a, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old person. But I do think um, at the same time, it was um, Lord Jamar talking about being covered by three quarters cloths that kind of made women think about, you know, how, you know, what they wore. I don't know if that some people may have wanted to wear less and wanted to wear more. But I know I, I back to my original point, uh, you know, you know you know, Peace Queen and De Earth mm -hmm. and all that stuff, there was, there was still, even within some of the problematic yeah. stuff, there was an incredible amount of respect of things you didn't call women, mm -hmm. um, you, know, back, you know, back in the day. So it's, it's um, mm -hmm. like anything, it has two sides. Of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And right Funny. now there's so many Muslim, like, artists, hip hop artists out, like, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, I, I can't name everybody. You have Neelam, sister. She's like everywhere right now. I believe that's her name, right, Neelam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have Misunderstood. She's out of New York City. That's my friend. <laughs> She's from Queens. They killing it. And it's, a, I don't want to mess people's name up. But there's so much representation. So it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of coming full circle, mm -hmm. I think. And it makes you kind of, um, I, I, or maybe the, the males, the, the, the men in, in hip hop, you, they, they can, um, I guess, gain some inspiration from that and how they speak about women and to women, you know. So. Fame. Um, I, I wanna push back on the, uh, there's a lot of Muslim hip hop artists, cause, uh, <laughs> but I wanna stay on a point, I wanna stay on code. About well, we can, so we can come back yeah. to that. Um, I think for me, um, Manhood was a big thing that was very attractive to me uh, with Islam. So um, I had a father in a home. Um, it wasn't, you know, I was like raising a single parent. No, I had a father in a home. But um, I think that just seeing men organize was extremely attractive. First, it started with the gods and the earth when they would deform the cipher and they would sing the anthem. You know what I'm saying? Peace, Allah, and justice. I started seeing that as a little kid in the parks. You know, like brothers just be in, like, be like 20 brothers, 30 brothers, 50 brothers, and all singing in unison the anthem. That's the anthem for the gods of earth. You know, peace, Allah, and you know. For those who don't know, Clarence 13X, the father, is the founder of the five percent nation, and his right-hand man was justice. So that's basically, that's the anthem honoring them, you know, for bringing the nation. You know, so seeing that was extremely impressionable. Then seeing, you know, the Sunni Muslims from a talk with a 40-day watch, that was extremely impressive. Them going to war with the drug dealers in Bed-Stuy and seeing the brothers literally marching down the Fulton Street with flags and, and, you know, military precision, seeing that as a young person is like, whoa. I, was, I felt like that brother in the movie Malcolm X with the fruit. <laughs> He, I felt like him to stand like, what the hell just happened? You know what I'm saying? And, you know, my uncle knowing these brothers, you know what I'm saying? So I, I you know, from, from a manhood perspective, for young men, particularly young men who are, like, really not sure of themselves, and you can go to an elder, and you had access to elders, that was very, very um, impressionable for me. And... I think that's something I'm trying to impart with my son. Um, my son is 11 years old, and I'm always having him around brothers. You know, so um, he actually listens to my stories. You know, which, you know, I, 
you know, I never had that particular connection with my dad, but Islam basically gave me a connection in terms of how I could deal with my son from learning from the son of the master, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So how he dealt with his family and his companions gave me a roadmap. So seeing from the examples of men in the street and also me learning more about the deen and seeing the examples of the greats, you know, from the Prophet, from the Sahaba and other scholars, helped me push, you know, to really kind of like redefine what manhood is for me as a Muslim and as a black man in America. So um, that's how you know, it, it affected me. Mm -hmm. I guess I just add to that. I think that um, you know patriarchy is a mug, and, um, <laughs> and you say a mug <laughs> or a drug. <laughs> it's a drug. All, all of them, right? Of and so I think you know hip hop music and culture is a part of hip hop music culture comes out of broader society, and patriarchy is something we struggle with everywhere, mm -hmm. in this country, other countries in the world, and we struggle with that. I think, so I think that, so therefore, I think sort of these iterations go into what Wes was saying, right, this idea of like, you know, there's, and even some Fahim was saying in terms of the idea of what does it mean to be a man? What does right. it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to have family, right? I mean, what, and what do those roles and what should that look like? I think, so I think that is something that, is something that, you know, a lot of the sort of early hip hop, particularly sort of that really was on that sort of nod to self Islam stuff, you know, came out of a black radical tradition, but that was also very male dominated, right? Mm -hmm. It often paternalistic, like I always tell this story where I remember once me and my friend, we was in Best Stuy, we had some like Chinese restaurant, and I think it must have been like 12 or something like that. And I wore a head, we both wore head scars. And so this brother, he comes into the Chinese restaurant and he's about to cuss out the Chinese person and he's like, he pauses, and he's an adult. He turns to us, these 12-year-olds, to excuse, uh, pardon me, sisters, I'm about to cuss this man out, right? So, because, because the sense of respect, right? So he was right. like, well, these are Muslim women, I can tell, even though they're girls, but I need to, I'm about to do something I shouldn't be doing, right. so I'm gonna let them know and pause, you know, that kind of thing. So, so, so that kind of stuff, right, is funny, and, it's, and, and for me, growing up as a woman, as a Muslim woman in hip-hop culture, like, that's my expectation. Right? My expectation is always that people have a, a lot of respect for me because they're like, oh, I know what this is. The sort of flip side of that right, can be this kind of paternalism and this kind of mm -hmm. restriction, right? And so I think, so I think we, kinda, we continue to struggle with that because even in terms of like, um, what Slima was saying in terms of artists, right? You know, I think in particularly in Muslim communities, and this is again a reflection of hip hop, which is a reflection of society, is that women get marginalized, they can't do the same kind of things men can do, like, you know, like misunderstood. As I also know her, and you know, I like to say she was one of those people who used to, um, she used to do a lot of remixes. So like there's like a popular song or something, right? And she would like remix it, right? And she can spit, right? Like, I mean, she's not whatever, right? But there are these dudes from like Canada who like started doing the same stuff. Like, huh? Yeah, Dean Squad, who people know them, right? <laughs> it's like, and you're like, you're like, and you know, and I mean, and I mean, and you just kind of like, where, you know, and people know them, and like, with particularly internally in Muslim communities, or even like other people will like when like the broader society wants to anoint someone as a Muslim artist or MC, particularly who like they think is Muslim, it won't be someone like her who's been doing this kind of stuff for like decades. It'll be some person who's like a real amateur. And that's cool to be amateur, I'm an amateur, right? But like people put, put in work and they don't get recognition. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think, and gender also plays a role in that, right? Where that women can easily be kind of, oh, you know, over here, and she's been doing something, and a guy comes out and does it, and it's like, ooh, you know. So, yeah. I have uh, two more questions, and then we'll, we'll get to the audience, so bear with us. We're gonna try to keep these, yeah. this next. Uh, but Suad, you, you mentioned something that made me um, wonder about, so the next two questions are about how is hip hop showing up in the Muslim community, and then how is Islam showing up in hip hop today? But, so I know that we already kind of inched towards that. I started, somebody sent me, Tone Trump, yes. um, and I was looking at his videos, and I was like, "Whoo, this is not, it's not your, right this is not rock and roll. This is not a trap call. This is not your uncle's hip hop, um, but um, or my hip hop." Uh, but I, I want you, because I know that you've done, you did field work. Yes. Um, so I got to plug her book again, right. Muslim Cool, which is on sale at our bookstore. Right. Um, she did field work yeah. in Muslim communities yeah. in terms of how hip hop was functioning. So if you you can tell us a little bit about how hip hop is showing up yeah. in the Muslim community. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Okay, so I'll be, I'll try to make it 
sum it up real quickly. Sum so, up your book in right, like, like in like a two minutes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the book, right, Muslim cool. So that's the title. So the title and is a way that I is a term that I used to describe a way of being Muslim that I see in Muslim communities in the United States. Right. It's a way of being Muslim in which people are sort of engaging, um, sort of um, through ideas through activism, through fashion and style, sort of in engaging hip hop culture as a way to be Muslim that pushes back against white supremacy. White supremacy as it shows up in the broader society, but also as it shows up in Muslim communities and anti-blackness. So this is the idea. And part of what that means, and going back to knowledge of self, so I talk about this idea of the loop of Muslim cool. So what we've been discussing so far is kind of the first bend, right? So you have these black Muslims and the ideas that they bring into black communities that shape hip hop, right? The next bend is this idea, so now hip hop has knowledge of self. It has like, assalamu alaikum like a Muslim. It has like peace, all this stuff is in there. Then you have these young people who are growing up Muslim in the United States who are hearing this, right? And finding themselves as Muslim in that music and then sort of, sort of ret and returning to kind of black Islam. So the idea of the loop of, of, of black Islam um, and, and of knowledge of self. And so I think what's important in terms of and related to some of what I was saying, I think it kind of shows up um, within Muslim communities, it also shows up, because really what I'm interested in in the book is like how does Muslim identity and black identity intersect, right? And which ways are we sort of pushing back against white supremacy and in which ways are we ending up actually reproducing it, right? Because of the ways we might, you know, blackness becomes a cool thing to do, but it's not a real thing to do, right? And so one of the things that I found is that for young black Muslims, right, and I think Salima kind of spoke to some of this, Right, the relationship between Islam and hip hop is like a confirmation and an affirmation, right? It's like, okay, I'm black and I'm Muslim. I knew that was okay, right? But I may have interacted with some Muslims who were like, that's not okay. But when I, when I, when I hear these music, when I hear this music, when I see this culture, it's like, oh yeah, this is who I am. And that's real and that's true and that's okay. And then for like non-black Muslims, particularly I did a lot of work with Muslims of South Asian descent and Arab Americans. It's sort of like, who the hell am I in this place called the United States of America? I'm Muslim, I'm not black, I'm not white, like how do I fit? And so the hip hop music and culture kind of gave them a way to kind of figure that out. But you know, I am like this one guy, um, uh, Omar Mokhtar, he would talk about like how hearing, and similar actually echoing what Slima was saying. He was saying, I felt kind of a part, but when I heard Nas and the Fugees saying things that I knew, then I was like, oh wait, I am a part of something. Right? And I have a place. And then I have something I have to do because my community is perpetuating anti blackness. So I know this now, I have knowledge of self, and now I have a responsibility to kind of do something with that. So I think that's kind of what I found. And one other thing I would just say, though, I think I want to add to that is that so you had people for whom hip hop and Islam meant confirmation, it meant finding yourself. But then one of the issues that we continue to deal with is questions of cultural appropriation. And so the ways in which in some spaces, right, people are like, we don't want none of that hip hop, boobity boo, whatever. Because <laughs> that's that black stuff and it's like, it's bad and it's downwardly mobile and we don't want to do with that. Or they're like, oh yeah, bring your little hip hoppity hip, right? Because we want to raise, <laughs> because we want to raise money for like Syria or something. Right. But we don't want. But we don't. We don't, we don't know no black people. We don't do nothing with black people. You know. But yeah, bring hip hop so we right. can do that. So that's. <laughs> it's that, yeah. It's that everything but the burden. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, to to run around us out, and I'll start with Wes, but I'll I'll give everybody a chance because we've kind of been getting to this, you know, a lot of people, and I think we're. I think Salima might be the youngest of the panelists. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, so. um, with a very close second aside. Um, but I think that a lot of us kind of came of age um, during this first bend that yeah. you talked about. Um, and, and, you know, just part of youth culture being what it is, we tend to have the fondest memories about the thing that accompanied our coming of age. The 90s and was the best, son. <laughs> <laughs> 90s hip hop was the best set. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, um, you know, now, you know, it was remarkable back then, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you were in the community or not, it was remarkable to hear someone say, Assalamu Alaikum, in a major 
media production um, that people well outside of the Muslim community were, were listening to, to see Arabic script, to, mm -hmm. to see images of mosques that were not, you know, in, in the 80s and in the early 90s, if you heard the Adhan on TV, it was in a news broadcast about war in the Middle East. Right. But if you were listening to watching BET or Video Jukebox or whatever, and you heard the Adan, it was like brand Nubian or somebody like that. And that was remarkable. Um, now it's not remarkable. It's present, but it's like, oh yeah, you know, so like Jill Scott or Slip In, we'll talk about Sewer 3118 and keep on moving. Like it's just normal, right? And she ain't gonna tell you what Sewer 3118 is about because she assumes you already know, right? So that on the one hand, it's like a kind of progress uh, that it has become so present that it doesn't need to be remarked upon. Um, but on the other hand, has something lost, been lost by a kind of intentionality, right? Um, that, you know, I, I don't wanna single out, but I was watching Tone Trump's video and he has like a, a baseball jacket. It has like Inshallah on the back. He's like a Philly, Philly yeah, based yeah. artist. And he has like a gold, you know, like a, the, the Allah version of a Jesus piece, like platinum, Allah <laughs> in Arabic. It's just like stuff that is different than what we would normally kind of think of when we think of, of the, the kind of consciousness raising mm -hmm. that we associated mm -hmm. with. And so I just, I, I, I kind of put that all out there. I want y'all to, pushback. yeah, I want to, I want to hear what you think about what, <laughs> where, what, how, is it, how is Islam showing up in hip hop today? And, and, I'm, I'm, I'm and glad when you, you see that? I'm glad I hear you. you contextualize that so well because that's my pushback and it's something I've been building with for the past two weeks it's like we've had a lot of to me minor wins but a lot of major losses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. culturally right so we may have a lot of Muslim hip-hop artists but they don't got no impact out here mm -hmm. there's no impact out here you know what I'm saying so I mean it's like that I mean the times inform the music right so it seems like this, this, we have social media, but we're so far apart, we're so separated. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there could be a thousand more rappers than what came out in the 80s and early 90s, but those 10, 20 rappers shook up the world. Shook up the world, <laughs> literally. So it's like, yeah, you got you know, some Canadian rapper here, some brother who's from from Jordan there, another brother from sister from the UK, but they got, as it's a youth slang, they got no wins on the streets. There's no winner because people don't even know about you. But even if you have good, in, in, good music and good you know, intentionality, um, however, it's like, there's this also like this super righteous, you know, Muslim artist that a lot of people's like, look, I just want you to be real, just be who you are. Like, you know, we, me and my man E, we saw a video last, last year or two years ago, some brothers from the UK talking about, look at my ice, look at my car, mashallah. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that's Islam and hip-hop today? That's not support, that's astaghfirullah. <laughs> like, like, word? Look at my ice, look at my... So you're trying to use Islamic lingo with hyper-capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is Islam. Like, I don't want that. I want you to be like, look, what's going on in South Africa, what's going on in Palestine is wrong. Boom, 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 Allahu Akbar. You know, I want to hear something like that. <laughs> but not no look at my ice, mashallah. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, it's, that's not the soul of Islam and hip hop. That is not the soul of Islam and hip hop. So for those of you who like these particular artists, you know, mashallah. <laughs> But you're not gonna hear me rock none of that. <laughs> or none of my people's rock none of that. So a lot of it, some of it may be age, you know what I'm saying? Some of it may be age, but also Muslim, what that means. You know what I'm saying? Like for those of us who are met, you know, young brothers coming up, that was like, as we say, that was like the hardest thing on the block. Mm -hmm. I remember I went to a project with my brother right here and my brother Big Mo who passed away, and may Allah grant him Jannah. So we was in the projects, and I pulled out a prayer rug. I was like, yo, it's time to pray. You know what I'm saying? And I went up to a dude 
who was smoking weed in our air. I was like, yo, my brother, you know, we're about to make slot, you know what I'm saying? Can you put that out? So he tried to talk a little mess, and I was like, I put, I moved this, the rug, I just walked up to him, I was like, my brother, I'm, not gonna, I'm just only gonna say this once. Can you put that out? He looked at me, he's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> For me and brothers of mine, that's what Islam means. That's what Islam means. That vigilance, that intentionality. So it's not no, look at my ice. Look at my car, mashallah. <laughs> it's like, yo, my brother, there's a sister right here. You can't be using that language. You understand me? I was at Master Khalifa with some brothers, and it was a brother, you know, young brother, walking his pants down. And the brother's like, yo, yo, I, yo, pull them pants up. And he did it on the spot, on command. That's Islam. It's not this soft stuff. So yeah, we have a lot of artists, but it's soft and weak and whack. Nobody, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it like said, it is. Nobody said it was good. Like it's it representation. <laughs> look, look, t, 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 can you look? Can you see how hard it was to get a good review uh, from this girl? Yeah, bro. <laughs> um, Salima. Yeah. You wanna? Yeah. Or anyone, I don't want to call you any, anybody. This this will be the final, and then we'll we'll open it up to to questions from the audience. Can you give me the question again? <laughs> how, how do you feel Islam is showing up in in hip hop today? Okay, let's say um, in pop pop culture popularity. I mean, as far as who is who is seen more, mm -hmm. the most. You got like. Um, like he said, you don't. It, I'm not talking about whether they're good, whether it's good or not. It's with, <laughs> it's just that I see myself, you know. And but you can make it. You can be have discernment and know like this is whack. But you there though. <laughs> Somebody I don't know. It's, it's you know what I mean. So I think um, I feel because I don't listen to it. I'm just saying. <laughs> Fahim does shamed yeah. everybody up. Yeah. 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 So, so I, it's there talk. though, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. Let's see. You got people like uh, what's his name? What's the guy name? The Alicia Keys husband. Oh, Swiss Beats. Swiss Beats. People Swiss Beats and. And Fresh yes, Montana Paris. and DJ yeah. Khaled and right, 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 right. This is well. Listen, I don't. <laughs> 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 right, it's hard, but like, but that shows you the state, right, that we're in as far as like who's, yeah. Um, but let me tell you something: the, the hip hop that I was influenced by, as far my favorite female MC is Lin Q, aka Isis. Like she comes hard, and she's not even Muslim, but still, like she was as far as she was covered, and she was spitting hard. Yeah, Black Watch and, movement. Yeah, yes. yeah, X Clan. Mm -hmm. X Clan, right? And. Um, I don't know, as far as like just being here and feeling hip hop be present in Islam is like on, on parallel to, to social media, I feel like. Cause like I said, nobody's being, there's not no big artists out there as far, except for those guys that are throwing it out. Sometimes you might hear them say some words or whatever. But as far as um, us, the consumers, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I mean, so I, yeah, I think I want to say it. So I am, um, what do I want to say? So I think it's kind of like, so on one hand, I feel Fahim in the, sense, in, in, in the sense that like, there's something about excellence, mm -hmm. right? And not even like whatever you're talking about, but like mm -hmm. there's something about like, like being a lyricist, particularly someone like, like rapping, right? MCing, right? Like, like actually doing that well. Right? Right, 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 that and that because of sort of the hyper capitalism, because of the way hip hop becomes a commodity, you don't really have to do that well, right? If you have a good hook, if you have the right promotion, people pay whether you go on the radio, you don't have to do that well, mm -hmm. and you become really famous, and you're like representing hip hop everywhere, right? And that so that's something that I think is true about hip hop in general, and then also going to relay itself out in terms of like Muslims doing hip hop too, but. Um, and so I, so I, and I want to preserve that kind of excellence and expertise too. Like I want to encourage that. At the same time, the reason why I brought up Tony Trump because I saw like, um, I think I saw like the, a video on like Facebook or something. I was like, who's this dude, right? And because I hadn't heard of him, and he's from Philly, and and the thing about it is, and it is like he calls himself a Muslim don, and there's this way in which, but it is like because here's the thing, like even kind of going back to what Wes said earlier. 
like you talking, on one level you're talking consciousness, on another level you consciously saying this woman has to be submissive to you, right? Mm -hmm. So on one level, right, you talk, I'm, I'm about to get this bag, but I'll love you making salah. Like, so I'm not sure how different that is in terms of the contradiction that is mm -hmm. there, right? Because the contradiction that's there. And so I think like, and also I feel like, because this, this idea, because I'm also concerned about impact, because it's true, right? And I wonder, like somebody like a Tone Trump, right? Like, I think he is actually banging in the streets. Like, I actually, I, I actually think no, he, he right, right? He so like, if he, so even though like, he is not like the exact replica or whatever of, and he, and he has, he, there are things we might want him to improve upon or whatever, but I think there's a, there's a constituency of our people, right, who I think somebody like that actually is talking to. And so there's a way I think, unlike, like, well, poor Dean Squad, but like, <laughs> but I'm like those dudes, right? That's a different whole situation, right? But like, there's some people who are like real, like I guess they're, you know, they're so, they're like they're Muslim, and they're hella hood, right? And they're bringing that together, and I think that that's resonating, and I think that's something that we want to try to think about how to how to engage, even with the ways in which it's contradictory. Wes, you get two minutes. Yeah, yeah, I, I know we, we're running over. I just want to maybe push back a bit on, on Fahim thing. I had a conversation about a couple of years ago with the Tats crew. I don't know if uh, how many graffiti heads we had in here. And they were really, uh, at one level, upset. Yes, from the Bronx, yes. <laughs> from the Bronx, I'm from the Bronx. South Bronx, no doubt, all of that. Um, but they were upset, sort of, we were, uh, you know, about how the, the different disciplines in hip hop that graffiti had been sort of pushed right. to the back and actually had just not cashed out, like the MC or even the B-boy or B-girl. And then I had uh, a conversation, but that I said, if you look at it, the entire industry of advertising is based upon your philosophy. Mm -hmm. Social media, and we had a, a, I, had a, I did a pick when I was in grad school about, you know, when, when it's somebody's birthday and on Facebook, where do you say happy birthday? Where do you write it? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, we write it on their wall. Yeah. And I was like, that's, yeah. that's your metaphor, mm -hmm. right? A, 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 a private message in a public space. Mm -hmm. That's graffiti. So that in a sense that graffiti may have, you can't draw the direct connection mm -hmm. and make the transaction, but it has sort of enveloped the entire world. Mm -hmm. I think back to what we're talking about, about Islam and hip hop. You, may, you, you can critique individual people, and this I'm not familiar with some of these cats that y'all talking about, but the philosophy is what we live. It's the, we're almost fish, and we can't quite describe water, mm -hmm. is, how, is how I look at it. And it's, I'm gonna get your book, because I think that's what, it's a feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. You heard rappers, maybe wise, intelligent, you know, saying this, I remember Brand Newbie and having the song Alu Akbar, I had never heard that before, right? We were raised in a Methodist household. So you heard that and was like, oh snap, that's my call to prayer. And I'm thinking like, what are they talking about, mm -hmm. right? And I wanna sort of, so I think it's on a feedback loop. Right. And now, being from a historical perspective and being a little bit of the businessman of, of drawing the direct connections, I know Jay-Z has 120, mm -hmm. right? I know people in Trenton who taught Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. So then for when I do a deal, with, with, when I do business with Rock Nation, you, I can see mm -hmm. the philosophy that Jay has put into Rock Nation. He just did a deal where he signed like Jazz O, right? right? That to me, there's no money in there. That's honoring the elders. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I'm on, now I'm gonna share the money. Now, can I draw that directly to mm -hmm. a passage in the Quran? I, I certainly can't, maybe, you know, you, you guys are much are the scholars in here, but the philosophy is in there. Even the most ignorant dude is right. still, that's how he was raised. We can do something, right, you, you know, have raising kids. I, you find it, talk to your kids, and you're like, that's my grandmother said that to me. So you look at a little Uzi Vert, not to go on sorry to hear, but there was a, a, a little clip, he was at a show, and there was a, a, a disabled fan in the front row. He stopped the show, grabbed some merch from back, jumped down on stage and gave the kid some t-shirts and jumped back on stage. Now I critique that kid all mm -hmm. day long, mm -hmm. but I'm like, who taught you how to do that? Mm -hmm. Who taught you how to treat people lesser than, you know, maybe who may not have the blessings mm -hmm. that you have and treat them but respect? That goes back to mm -hmm. 
when, you, when your father maybe heard Minister Farrakhan on a public enemy record and all the things that you guys, so it was put into the culture, it can't be taken sort of out. So there may be losses that you can't point, and there's, uh, I think you said there's it's minor, 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 minor losses. I, I think it's the opposite. I think you've won the war, and there's a couple of battles here and there that look, <laughs> that's what I think it is. Because we're, we're without you, because without I'm, I'm gonna have to take moderator's yeah. privilege now. Um, and you and it's true. <laughs> Swat yeah. is like beating me down. Like you get 30 no, seconds. No, 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 because actually, no, because I, I really appreciate what you said. Because I make this argument too, and this is what knowledge itself is about. Because like even I feel like even in the most kind of like base hip hop, right? Knowledge of self will, it, it appears, mm -hmm. it is there. And so people say, where is Islam in hip hop, right? Well, sometimes it's like Lil Mo on Love and Hip Hop making Salah that happens, right? But other times it's just really like, it's this idea of knowledge of self and the way that that continues to sort of permeate the music and culture. That's All right, we're gonna open it up to the audience. <laughs> We have, um, we have a floating microphone. If you raise your hand, we'd get the microphone to you. Uh, there's one right here. And we, we, we do ask that you limit your, please a question, just a question. No question. Salaam Um I just want to say that um, I think brothers like Tom Trump are important. Um, because if he's, I still live in the hood. I'm saying I've been harassed by the cops two times this week. Um, mm -hmm. They thought I had a gun, and I was jumping rope outside. I'm saying so I'm black first, um, and I think it's important to understand the integration between biology and technology right now. So I'm gonna the, have to ask your brother for your question. Hold on, hold on, real quick. So the the hip hop is bigger than the mosque right now. I'm saying so kids are listening to this drill music, and it's really getting instilled into their neurology, their, their neurological patterns of how they think, you know I'm saying? So we really have to be aggressive when we talk about spoken word and hip hop. And I'm a spoken word artist and I'm in these, in these venues, and to have to go against 10 other people that's, talk, that's reciting drill music is not an easy task. So I think that linking up is really important. What do you think we need to do to combat the gatekeepers who don't allow people who really spit, you know I'm saying, mm. and put their they heart behind this. What do we do to combat that? Okay. That's a good question. Um, well, because of technology, just do it yourself. Really, I mean, I was at a conference in North Carolina with, you know, little brother when they was together, and there was record execs there, you know, from Def Jam, a whole bunch of labels. I was like, do it yourself. Do it yourself. I mean, listen, we don't own hip hop, right? When hip hop was emerging, well, we, we did own it, but we didn't own the industry. So the industry dictates to us what our taste should be and everything like that. So now 15 years later from the emergence of it, we start switching up and everything like that. So I think to, to preserve the integrity, to preserve your voice, let's do it yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, the 360 deals, all that, it does, it's no money in going to no label or going to some you know, particular house, unless you have a, a, a partnership. If you see yourself as a business, you go into business with them, but don't go as an artist looking for some deal. You know what I'm saying? Like, those days are over, and also that weakens your voice. What empowers your voice is do it yourself, man. You know what I'm saying? Just do it yourself. Okay. Um, yes, we have two, two hands over here. Three. Yes. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. So I see there's, um, thank you so much. I got a lot of information out of that. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I see there's a lot of uh, spoken word places that's popping up now. And so I'm hearing some Islam in, in those places. Like people, like you said, it's more like consciousness. It's a consciousness, so you can't just um, expect to hear what you want to hear, but you're going to hear information that is uh, going to increase your knowledge. And so basically what I wanted to ask you was, I, I know that Nicki Minaj got discovered from MySpace. And you told the brother just now to do it yourself. And recently Spotify said they're gonna stop letting people upload their music. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, it's like every time someone seems like they find a way to make a way to, to, to get up on, on top, you know, there's a block. And I think that's what he's talking about when he says the gatekeepers, you know, it's trying to keep people down. So really and truly, I just want to say that, like, um, the spoken word artists, because you mentioned a lot of people and, you know, you're up and coming. And I, wanted, I saw my brother Donique in the back back there, you know, and he's another one, you know, that's out there, but we're just not getting people enough credit, you know, for what they do. And, and I think that the, um, it's really not a question, it's just more like a statement. I'm seeing that the pop-up spots, you know, the spoken word artists is the ones that's getting it through. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, for the panelists, if we, I'm going to ask you to hold your responses. I want to get the two, there were two hands. Get the two questions, please. I'm going to ask the, uh, uh, Bo, I'm, oh, I see three. Bo, I'm going to ask you to hold the microphone. Yes. I'm sorry, we got to do this because we, we are over time. Um, your question, then that brother right there in the back, and there was someone over here, and then we'll go to the panel. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam. Thank you for everything. Um, the question I want to ask is that there's a strong emphasis upon the oral tradition in both Islam and hip hop. Why do you think the oral tradition is so effective in sending out these warning messages and communicating to the people? Okay, thank you. Next uh, question right there. <laughs> Walaikum salam. Hold the mic, hold the mic. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam. Um, we, we talked a lot about the uh, incongruence in the content of Islam, of, uh, hip hop, in Islam and hip hop. And I just wonder, Given the information and how we take in Islamic information or what we perceive to be Islamic information, do you see that battling the ability to have contradictions? For example, when I hear things, I'm like, oh man, the brother, the I keep saying it, but man, he said this. And that bothers me when I listen to hip hop. And what degree do you feel that that's affecting the broader Muslim? Uh, okay. Program? And then the third question. Assalamu alaikum. I just Salaam. want to know if I can get everyone on the panel to tell me what their favorite line is from a hip hop song that resonates with <laughs> I think that's an excellent way to close out. Okay, so first uh, was the question about the oral tradition and, and why, why is that um, so, so important? No. Um, why, so why is it so important? Yeah. And it's getting these warning messages, warning messages out. Huh, that's a good question. I, I think that's a, I don't know if, I don't know if it's a why is it so important. I think maybe, maybe we could just think about, we, we see it, hmm, I don't want to answer that. I feel like it's effective, right, because of the ways in which, I think a lot of it has to do with how humans communicate, right? and the ways in which language, and language both in terms of um, sort of words themselves, but also sounds and how you say them and how you move your body. Because also like, like a, a dope MC is, the words are important, but also the flow and the body and like how the delivery, all of that makes you write great, right? In, in, in a certain kind of way. So I think, so I think it's, I think, I think the oral tradition becomes important because I think of the ways in which humans are sort of wired perhaps, and not to be, I'm an anthropologist. I don't do like biological determinism stuff, right? So, but um, but in terms of just in terms of how we communicate with each other, right? And I think most most human communities are oral traditions, right? So we in this society are very what they call logocentric. So it's very about writing everything down. But most people, most people in the world, the way you begin is through orality. Like that is how you begin. You begin through sort of sound and voice and speaking and body language and that kind of thing. And so I think that's a kind of very kind of fundamental ways in which human beings communicate communicate in general. And so therefore, if you're trying to sort of then send a message, right, to people that you want them to grasp, but you speak to them in the language they understand. And we typically say that, I think, in terms of like literal languages, but I think the orality is a language that people kind of understand in a broad sense, right? And even people who sort of don't hear or don't speak, right? Again, even like the rhythm, there's like the heartbeat, all these things continue to sort of express that. So I think there's something kind of fundamental to human beings and communication that therefore lends itself to why these partic this particular way of communication can be so powerful. Uh, and I'll just add, as, as a world historian who, we just did this oral history project, in addition to the orality, um, you know, the written version of a spoken word is a reduction, right? Um, there are pauses that can't be represented in time. There's tone that can't be represented. There's inflection, there's rhythm. None of that can really be effectively represented in a written form. And part of transforming the spoken word into a written form was to create a product, right? So it's much more commodifiable, whether it's recorded either as an audio recording or as, as a written um, a depiction. And then the last thing about the orality, it, it gives many more people the opportunity to create a record, 
right? Um, when historians research the past, we look in the archives and we go look at old documents and things of that nature. And you think of who has the privilege and the resources to leave a written record in newspapers, in letters, in diaries, and then have those records be archived at institutions such as this one, right? Uh, they tended to be men, they tended to be white, they tend to be wealthy. Um, and oral history is a way to break that um, hegemony. Uh, over the control of the historic record. So um, the brother was the question of the incongruence yeah. and then the favorite line will close out. So the incongruence yeah. will sweep down. Assalamu alaikum. That was an excellent question. And I, I like to approach it from, where's my OG? Where's brother? Where's the God divine? Where he at? I just saw him. In. Peace. That's my OG. And I want to say salam to the soldiers from Humble Mosque number seven. And I, I, why I want to acknowledge that, because that's, that's a part of my story. 5% Ansar Nation Islam, you know what I'm saying, uh, Sunni Sufism. And I think we have to, as a people, as black people, like we just have to embrace our story, embrace who we are and where we're at. And for development, we have to embrace the contradictions. You know, as Muslims, you know, obviously our tradition is informed about, you know, basically trying to reach the higher self by following the path of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him, right? Yet, contextually, our story is unlike any other story on the face of the planet Earth. So we have to embrace that. So first is also just acknowledging who we are being where we're at, right? And me personally, I tell people when I have arguments with them, I was like, look, I'm not trying to be enlightened with you, I'm just trying to be honest. Then I can achieve by Allah's will enlightenment. But first, let's just be honest and being truthful. A lot of times that's not pretty and it's ugly. So, you know, when we talk about Tone Trump, I dig the, I think the, you know, the brothers is dope, you know what I'm saying? And, but I also think that he's a microcosm of the issues of the black Muslim community in America where we started off with, you know, Noble Ali, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, then Darul Islam, then certain influences come in and the Muslims are no longer connected to the communities that they're from. That's the problem. So we have Tone Trump who, who's probably, you know, probably, you know, because I know a lot of brothers in Philly, you know, like they're very educated in terms of the dean from a particular event, but they're very educated but they're not politically or socially connected. You know what I'm saying? And that's the issue. What, who told us that, who told black Muslims that we're supposed to be separated from our struggle? And that's why I feel alone a lot. You know what I'm saying? Because I refuse to, for any Muslim to be like, no, that's haram, it ain't about politics. Like, brother, if it wasn't for me seeing an FOI or me seeing that, I probably wouldn't buy a lost permission, but he'd be Muslim because I saw the examples. Right? So we have to embrace our story, and which includes the contradiction. So like, any Muslim who's like, you know, a brother or sister who wants to do poetry or hip hop, and haram, 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 like look, just push them to the side. <laughs> push them to the side. You know what I'm saying? Because you are a unique creation. And follow that uniqueness that Allah has endowed us with. But we have to be really embrace, embrace the honesty, embrace who we are. This is who we are. So we have to embrace Tone Trump as well as most deaf. Okay, um, I want to give us time to do our, I hope y'all are thinking about your favorite line. Um, I, I do want to touch on that contradiction thing and I think Suwak pointed out that the contradictions aren't new and I think Fahim is pointing out the contradictions aren't new. It, for anyone who knows the history of, of the Muslims in Philadelphia, um, it's a contradictory history, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> On the one hand, you had a very powerful mosque mm -hmm. in the Nation of Islam under the leadership of the minister Jeremiah Shabazz. Right. On the other hand, you had elements within that mosque who, um, in order to counter the influence of the mafia, had to organize and produce the same kind of counterforce which lent itself to the emergence of the Black Mafia. I mean, it was called the Black Mafia, and there were Muslims who were instrumental, or people who identified with Islam, who were instrumental in the formation of that, that entity. So, and this, we're talking about the 60s and the 70s, right? So we can't really beat up too much on Tone Trump 
right. who 50 years later is calling himself the Muslim Don, there in his mind, probably, or in his articulation, there is at least a 50 year tradition of African American Islam that he is participating in. It may not be the one that we want to acknowledge, exactly. it may not be the one that we want to highlight, but it, it was there, right? Um, so I think uh, you know it's important for us to kind of face that that contradiction. Um, I, I want to acknowledge a brother, um, and I'm going to give him one minute, no, 30 seconds. Hassan, mm -hmm. Hassan Muhammad, who is, uh, you know how they say you should have a mentor who is like way younger than you to kind of keep you mm -hmm. in touch with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Hassan is when I'm his mentor, and he's my mentor. So Hassan, if you can, you get 30 seconds. Thank you and so tell much. us who you are. I'm just gonna jump straight into okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so just one thing that I wanted to add as like a context note. So though though Islam became very prevalent in hip hop through fashion, the, the, the political expressions and everything else, wanna lift up the cultural origins of R and B and soul back in the sixties and seventies because there was a heavy influence through the social and political connections of a lot of the different art, artists because Islam represents represented the self determination and strength of the black community across the country. So, you know, you had uh, individuals at a James, Sam Cooke, James Butler, James Brown, Cool in the Gang, Delphonics. You had the Black Family Day in 1974, where it brought, brought together black and Latino, with Tino Puente, um, Celia Cruz, and others. And as a result of the, a lot of the violence that was happening in New York City, that happened at Randall's Island, 70,000 people. And as a result, a lot of things end up. Um, ended up getting better in the community as, um, on that. Aretha Franklin, 1972, there was a riot inside of New York City um, in Harlem when they, when they raided the mosque. Um, a couple of, Aretha Franklin used to attend the mosque very frequently under Ms. Lewis Farrakhan, and as a result, this is where Young, Gifted, and Black came, came out of. Also, James Brown's influence and connection with the Nation of Islam, um, black, and I'm, black and I'm Proud as well, so that, particular connection through r and and soul, you cannot forget when you're talking about hip-hop. Okay, thank you, thank you, Hassan. Uh, absolutely, um, you have that connection. Okay, Salima, your favorite line. My favorite hip-hop line? Yes. Do we need to, we need to come back to you? <laughs> We're gonna come back to you, yes. Wes. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, what was, keeps popping in my head is uh, thinking of a master, thinking of a master plan, because ain't nothing but sweat inside, inside my hands. hands. Why you had to take mine? No, go ahead. <laughs> Fahim. Bronx River, rolling thick with cool DJ Red Alert and Chuck Chill Out on the mix, where Africa Islam was rocking the jams, and on another side of town was a kid named Flash, Patterson and Millbrook Projects. Catching over all over, you couldn't stop it. There's nine lives crew, the Cypress boys, the real rock steady taking out these toys. No matter what you heard, no matter what this, I didn't hear a place, peep from a place called Queens. It was 76 to 1980. The trends in Brooklyn was crazy. You couldn't bring out your set with no hip hop because the pistols would go. <laughs> um. One thing from the verse, I think to, to answer the question before, audiences also need to step their game up. Like we need to get our weight up. So like, yeah. like how can we help people? Like people need to do their own stuff, but audience also, also need to like have some discernment and support. Um, I thought of a, I'm like, oh, there's this Kwali verse, there's this Sarak verse, there's this like Brother Ali verse, but the thing that's in my head is, who the, Paging me at 546 in the morning, crackers on and now I'm yawning. Wipe the coal from my eye, see who's this paging me and why. <laughs> All right. See, see y'all would have never thought you would have come to Brooklyn Historical Society to hear some Muslim spit biggie, right? I mean, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, Crown Heights represent. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. All right. Um, Salima. I should know from MC Light. I'm a slave, I'm a slave, I'm a slave to the rhythm. What is it? Spitting deaf rhymes on a microphone is what I'm given. That's, that's all I need to know. <laughs> that was my favorite. Light all right. Light, 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 light. 
So um, I wasn't, I'm going to say mine, which was, and the reason this is the one is because I grew up in, in the DMV. Uh, where go-go was our local folk music. And so I was really excited when I heard my mic sound nice, check one. My mic sound nice, check two. My mic sound nice, check three. Are you ready? Because I'm the queen on the mic and I don't know the rest, but y'all know. Check it out. Okay. All right. Um, I want to thank you all for being a patient audience. We went over time, but I hope you found it valuable. Um, before you go, I want to make sure you know that Suad's book, Muslim Cool, is on sale and she'll sign it. Um, also, want to let you know that. Um, both Suad and Fahim's oral histories are online on our oral history portal. Uh, you can get that from our website. Um, who else got stuff to promote? This is the promotion reel. Uh, Salima, what's your next gig? So should we, um, I'm going to be at Brick Celebrate Brooklyn August 10th at Prospect Park, the Band Shell, 7 p.m. if you guys want to come out. All right. And spoken word, lyric and what we say is important. They're prayers. Yeah. That's to me, I think right. that's like important. Wes, what's, what, you, what you got? Well, well normally I have something to promote, but we take the year off. I would just want to just support Zaheer's project with the Muslims, yeah. Muslims in, in Brooklyn is so, so important. And as the board members support, you know, this is a special institution to give a platform like this. There's a lot of people down the block, we ain't gonna say no names, that wouldn't support uh, this project. So um, mm -hmm. try to come back here, this is, this is this is a great program. There's a lot of great programs in here. So, but I just want to say thanks to Zaheer and everything that he's done. Thank you all. To support that and with that, we are going to greet you as we came with Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.